excited for you guys. We have a three-part lesson. It's going to be me, Rich, and uh, Jesse preaching the word this morning for you. So I hope you came this morning ready to worship the Lord. Uh, to start off, I wanted to share this, uh, this opening of the book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. It's written by Robert Coleman, and he says the master, talking about Jesus, disclosed God's strategy of world conquest. He had confidence in the future precisely because he lived according to that plan in the present. I hope you're present this morning. There was nothing haphazard about his life. No wasted energy, not an idle word. Man, how many of us can say that we have no wasted energy and not an idle word came out of our mouths? He was on business for God. I hope you're, you're here doing God's business. He lived, he died, and rose again according to schedule. He never hit the snooze button. Ooh. Like a general plotting his course of battle, the Son of God calculated to win. So I hope you brought your spiritual calculators so we can learn how to win this morning. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verse 24 in 1 Corinthians. And the Bible says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. That's some strong words right there. Strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Imagine a crown that never loses its shine. That's the crown we get to pursue. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The title of my portion of the lesson this morning is Running the Race to Win. I hope you came ready to run the race this morning. And uh, my one and only point for you guys is uh, what it's going to take to run the race to win is focusing on a goal. Make sure you're focused on a goal. And, you know, this, this statement is true. Usually, people who don't like goals are the ones who don't really want to change. Because isn't that why we set goals? We, we have uh, our New Year's resolutions. We notice, man, I was really out of shape last year. I want to set a goal to get in shape. Man, I was really debt in last year. I want to make sure I get out of debt this year. So if you want to change, you're going to set a goal. And people who don't set goals and don't work towards improving themselves, they don't succeed. In whatever it is, whether it's athletics, whether it's your job, whether, whether uh, you're a disciple, focusing on a goal is going to help you to reach the levels you've never reached before. You, we all know this quote, if you aim for nothing, you hit it every single time. But how about this one? If you don't focus on the things you want to change, you simply won't change them. You know, Paul had a deep spiritual conviction about the race we're running together. If we're going to make it to heaven, and hopefully heaven is your ultimate goal, we need to do it with complete focus. You guys with me this morning? In Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, let us run the race that's already marked out for us. We need to set a goal to be focused on. It's not about just being in the race. It's not about just going through the motions. I can confidently say that one, one of the biggest things I've learned this year is that it's too easy to just go through the religious motions. We're reading your Bible, it just turns into something you're just checking off the list in the morning, if you do it at all. Praying to the creator of the universe can become just another passive conversation that we're having. Being about our purpose, it can become something we start to take for granted. 
But Paul said the Corinthian athletes went through strict training for the prize that won't last. Normally it's a laurel crown, a flower garland, or a, a celery wreath that would soon wither. But the only thing, uh, or one of the biggest things I've learned from athletics is you will always go through pain, tough times, and wanting to quit. But if you don't have a goal in mind, you're going to just stop running eventually. If you don't see the end in front of you, you'll just want to quit. As the pain starts, your side cramps, you're having heavy breathing, and you just go, well, I'll just wait till tomorrow to get started on this thing again. Maybe I'll wait till next week. And you quit again, and again, and again, and then you give up, and you never reach your goal. So what's the goal? Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I do a little better preaching. If uh, you want to get off of, uh, of mute and you say amen, go ahead and do it. But let's go to Revelation 21, verse 1. The Bible says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is, is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. You know, there's no greater goal than heaven. You guys believe that this morning? A place where we get to live with God, where there's no death, there's no suffering, where we, can, where we get to just truly rest and the streets are made of gold. There's no greater goal than being able to look back at the end of our lives in heaven and go, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. You know, however, though, it, it, it always shocks me to read the news about some successful or famous person or someone who was highly loved ending their life before their time. You know what I'm talking about? The lead singer of Lincoln Park, Chester Bennington. The famous actor, Robin Williams. The famous producer, Anthony Bourdain. In fact, if you look it up from 2001 to now, there have been over 267 suicides of people who are considered to be famous. It goes to show you that fame, fortune, and success does not lead to a life of fulfillment necessarily. And you may be saying to yourself, when I'm older, then I'll get serious about getting to know God and live for Him. You know, it'll shock you to know how many elderly people today are taking their lives. People who had worked so hard in their life, great military leaders, CEOs, former statesmen, politicians, and then what happens? There's an emptiness, there's a fear and insecurity after they retire about what lies on the other side of the door. I looked at the, the statistics for elderly people who take their lives, and it's just under 20% of all suicides are committed by elderly people. That's a fifth of all suicides. That's a staggering number to just read. Long life does not necessarily lead to a life of being fulfilled. You know, there's a Harley Davidson commercial. It says, if I had to do it all over again, I'd have gotten a Harley Davidson. You know, I relate that quote to our lives today. Because I wonder if those people who get to the end of their lives, who don't choose to follow God, are they looking back and going, man, if I can do it all over again, I would have found God and held on to him with all my might. So the question is, is our goal 
to make it to heaven? Or are we trying to make this world our heaven? Are we making every effort to see the face of God one day? Or do we already have our gods with little g's in our lives already? I find it fascinating. Anytime there's an accident, especially a fatal accident, people flock to it. There's just something about death, something about the unknown that draws a crowd. And I believe it's because God makes it clear to us. If we will only open our eyes, if we will only look to see God, that death is not a bad thing when we're in the Lord. And those of us who are in the Lord already, not in a sadistic way, we look forward to death. Why? Because we see the other side of death, and we get to see the eternal garden of Eden. We get to see the milk and honey that's on the other side of death. So here we are today, running this race. But what's the goal? The goal is not just finishing, it's not just getting through it, it's not wishing that you had another chance. The goal is being able to see what the lost son saw at the end of the road. A loving father, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Isaiah 6 says, who, who, who Isaiah 6 says, sits high and majestic on his throne. The lord of the universe who has made the universe the greatest father a person could ever have. And so we strive to obey, to humble ourselves before him, so that when it's all over, we'll be able to look and see the other side, to cross the finish line with a great cloud of witnesses the Bible talks about, to embrace our forefathers and mothers who are there waiting for us, and to run the race to win with heaven as our goal. Thank you. Hey man, good morning church. It's uh, it's been a while, and I'm fired up to preach the word. Amen. Um, man, it definitely, it, I definitely miss seeing you guys' faces. Um, but you know, I've been looking forward for this time, for this moment, all week. It's uh, it's been a while since I got to share a message with you guys, and I'm fired up to share what God has put on my heart. Amen. See. I've been reading this week, uh, I've been reading my Bible, as I hope you have been too, amen? And I've been reading my Bible, and I've been inspired by the book of Hebrews. And I want to share a little bit about what I've been learning. You know, you can, uh, in the book of Hebrews, it, it talks so much about Jesus, and you know, you can never talk too much about Jesus, amen? You can never learn too much, and we're not going to turn there, but in chapter 1, it talks about Jesus being the radiance of God's glory. You ever just look into the sun? I mean, I'm sure we've all done it, right? And you, you, it's either an accident or maybe you dared your friends to see who can look into it the longest, but you realize, man, you, you damage your eyes, right? And what did God tell Moses? When Moses told God, show me your glory, he says, you cannot see it because anyone who sees my glory cannot live. Right? But he only showed him from behind. And it says Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. You know, how many of us like authentic food? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm not a huge fan of imitation. Right? Imitation food. And, you know, when I, when I go shopping, I, I just think I, I love 100% beef burgers, amen, and some beef hot dogs. Um, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but uh, I've tried the veggie burgers, and you know they, they look really good, they smell good, they even look like a real burger, but it's just not the same. I really love the, the real, authentic food. And that's exactly what you see. When you see Jesus, you see God's being, His nature. He's not a fake, He's not an imposter. He's the real deal, amen? You know, and I could go on and on about what I've been learning, uh, but of course we have a uh, brother Jesse that's also going to preach, amen? Um, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to read here. We're going to learn a little, about, a little bit about Jesus this morning, amen? 
in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and would no longer feel guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You know, here we, here we learn that the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, it was given to the Jews just to give them a taste of the good things to come. Right? It's like smelling some, uh, some cookies that are being baked. Thank you, Courtney, for making those cookies. You just smell it, and your mouth is so watery. Uh, you, you just can't wait to eat them, right? Or you ever have a, you, know, you get a home-cooked meal from your mom or your wife, and you're just, man, your mouth is watery. You can't wait to eat it, right? This was what the Mosaic Law was giving to the Jews. It was just a taste of the good things to come. And... <clears throat> You know, in the Old Testament times, you would have to offer animal sacrifices, and that was only a taste of the cleansing of your sins, right? Your sins weren't really washed away. It was just a taste of your guilt being taken. And so every time you sacrificed an animal, it would open your eyes to see God's mercy, right? Because you and I deserve the punishment for our sins, but you would see this animal that God would accept on your behalf, and you would be grateful, right? You would realize, wow, the mercy of God, that blood needed to be shed, and God would accept this animal on your behalf. And it was done endlessly, year after year. But it says this is, that the sacrifices and offerings can never take the guilt away. They can never make you perfect, and so they had to continually be offered. So what happens? Every year you're reminded of your sins. You're reminded that you're a sinner. You know, you don't see your life change when you don't apply the message of God with faith. You know, you ever feel that way that you just can't change? Maybe there's, there's sin in your life that is just holding on to you, right? There's impurities that you just can't get rid of. The pornography, the drunkenness, right? The greed. It's the idolatry. I know I've been there. And what do you do? Eventually you notice, uh, you realize you, you just can't do it on your own. And so you come broken, begging God for change. Or you just give up. Right? You probably go to church week after week, and you don't see your life change. You go to church week after week, and you don't see any change in the church. Right? There's hypocrisy. Right? And it discourages you. You, you see the worldliness, and you think, man, I... I came to church to get away from this worldliness. And you see that it just followed you in there. And so then you give up on religion and you say, I I'm just going to make it about me and God, right? Just my relationship with God. But yet you start losing your faith. I'm sure the Jews are feeling like that. <clears throat> and then what happened? Well, the Bible says at just the right time, Jesus came to die for our sins. Let's keep reading in chapter, chapter 10, verse 4. It says, because, because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, I, here am I. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Can you imagine that? I mean, God is looking at the world and he sees the pain that all this sin is causing. The broken marriages, the broken families, the broken relationships caused by all this greed, this pride, this selfishness, the immorality. And it just hurts God to see his creation act this way. And what happens in the days of Noah says that it grieved God to see his creation in such sin. And he wiped out all those on the face of the earth 
because it was just too painful for him to watch. He could only find eight people to save. And I bet Jesus looked at God's face. And just as he was ready to punish the world, he said, Wait, here am I. I have come to do your will. And what was the will of God? There needed to be a sacrifice of atonement. One that will truly take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to be crucified and receive the punishment that you and I deserve. He came to be that atonement for our sins. Come on. I mean, what greater love is there in the whole world? Can you unmute yourself and say, thank you, Jesus? I mean, man, Jesus came to take your spot. You should have been crucified. I should have been crucified. But Jesus took our place in taking on the punishment of God. But then what? Since he died for our sins, should we just say thank you and go on our way? Should we feel bad for a moment and just do our best to be good people? Jesus had a hope when he died. And let's read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, Jesus didn't die just so we can be good people. But he died so we can be righteous. Come on, bro. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14 and 15, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. See, Jesus died in the hopes that you and me would live for him. That is how you thank Jesus. So just because he died for our sins, are, I mean, are we good to go? No, the Bible says if we deliberately keep on sinning, it's not heaven that awaits us, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. You know, we should li be living every day thanking Jesus by living for him, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Have you died to yourself? You know, are you still living for yourself, or have you died so that Jesus can live in you? Right? I think we we got to see when, when something is dead, it does not come back to life. Amen? And I've got to say, man, I'm grateful for the scriptures, for discipling, and for uh, the brotherhood. Um, you know, i got to say thank you to Joe. Even just yesterday, he gave me a call. And it, it was one of those moments where, you know, we're, we're talking, he's uh, asking about my life, and it's just, he, it's like your friend's listening to you, and he just grabs you by the shirt and just shakes you up, gives you a couple of slaps in the face, and says, bro, snap out of it. And you don't realize, and you're just like, man, I'm sorry, that, that was actually really stupid of me to think that way. That was foolish the way I was acting. Right? You ever been there? We just need your friend to shake you up and tell you to snap out of it. And you don't realize how foolish you've been, but we all need those friends, amen? You know, one thing that, that really hit home is when he said, you know, bro, God deserves better than that. Because, guys, I, I, I can be honest and open that, man, I've given in to the laziness, the, the selfishness, um, just sitting at home. And I, I think about, like, man, God absolutely deserves better than that. But, you know, after that phone call, I went on a great prayer walk, apologized to God, came home, apologized to my wife, and I even had to shake her up a little bit. And, man, I've got to say repentance is refreshing, amen? And I'm fired up to live for Jesus because I realize Jesus died for me and God absolutely deserves better than that. But are you giving your whole heart to God? You know, are you living every day thanking Jesus by living for him? That is the way we ought to thank Jesus. And if you need a friend to shake you up, I would love to be your friend. Uh, I know some friends that would love to be willing to help you out. And we, we can't do this on our own, amen? We need friends like Jesus. See, Jesus died to wash away your sins, but don't let this message just finish here. Take it with you. Get inspired to learn about Jesus. Get inspired to learn about what did Jesus really do for you. Get into the Bible. Start reading the Bible every day. Make a decision. You know, we got to let the love of Christ compel us 
because we're convinced that Jesus died for us and we ought to live a life that glorifies God. Amen. And when we arrive to heaven's gates, it's not going to be in a fearful expectation of judgment, but we can really look at Jesus in the face and say, thank you, Jesus. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Great job. Great That's, you know, as good as it gets right there. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, good morning, family. It's awesome to, uh, to know that you're on the other side of the screen there. I am encouraged. I am excited. I am just in a new place in life. If you didn't know, I recently got engaged to an amazing woman. Her name is Gina. And, uh, you know, Gina, I can't see you, but I love you. And uh, that's a little spiritual nugget there for you guys. Um, but if you guys turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, I have some amazing, amazing stories that I want to share with you that I, I think will inspire your relationship with God. See, going through this entire engagement process has taught me so much, and I can't help but to reflect on it. But before I talk too much about that, I want to share with you a different story, a, a flip side, if you will. I was walking outside yesterday by my house, and it was actually the night before. I saw a man. It was late at night, maybe 1030. It was cold and windy, and there was a man outside my apartment building sleeping on the sidewalk. And my first thought was, wow, that was a terrible place to choose. There's so many other places that you could sleep. And I went inside and forgot about it. The next morning, I, I went to leave my house, and the same man was right there. And he looked at me, and he asked me for money. And, you know, being who I am, I was kind of in a hurry to get to where I was going. I'm not the most on time all the time. And so I was like, no, 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 all I have is my keys. I got to go. And I started walking, and I get a little ways, and I, I feel convicted. I thought, wow, you know, I've got to help this man. And so I turned around, and I, I asked him what his name was. And as he looked up at me, you could just see how battered he was and how unclean he was and just the, the hope in his eyes that he might receive something. And, and I, I gave him a little money. It was all I had. I gave him a little money, and I, I walked away. And I got to thinking, wow, you know, it's, it's amazing how that seems so obvious. You can look at a man in that situation and see his condition and, and know very clearly the kind of suffering he's in and know very clearly the kind of uh, struggles he's facing and, and really the things he needs to overcome. The challenge I want to bring before you is that it's, it's easy to see that physically, but how, how do you know if you can see it spiritually? How do you know if it's applicable to your life? If you're in a Revelation in chapter 3, we're going to read a, a quick verse here in verse 15. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I know your deeds. Now, whether you know God or not, whether you read the Bible or not, this is still a true statement. He says, I know your deeds. I know what you've been doing. I know where you've been, and I know who you've been talking to. Sorry, we're getting a little feedback here on one of the computers. <laughs> Amen. Verse 16, or 15, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish... You are either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say that I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Some people are really like that. They, they are convinced that they're doing okay. Spiritually, they know God. Spiritually, they are, they are at peace and and they're just doing an awesome job. See, in their hearts, they're looking at God and they're saying, I am rich and I've acquired wealth. But, but listen to what Jesus says here. He says, the reality of the situation, he says, you, are, you, are, <laughs> you don't realize that you're wretched and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
I'm counseling you to buy gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, white and clothed, with white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. See, it's so easy to look at a homeless man and know exactly his condition, but sometimes it's not so easy to see our own spiritual lives and see our own spiritual condition. See, my, my question to you is, who are you married to? You know I had to throw it in there, right? Being engaged. Had to. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. So you look at a man who's homeless and you realize, man, he has made some bad decisions. But really, you don't know the whole story. If, if, we, if, we, were, if we were humble, each one of us, this isn't just a, a, a person who's successful or not, a person who's spiritual or not. Each person has to realize that they're spiritually poor and that they need help. Can we, all, can we all level there? Can we all be honest? Can we all be on the same page? This isn't somebody else. This is me and you. We all are spiritually poor. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, Christ is actually going to work to make you pure. But you've got to realize that that's what you need. See, it, uh, it, it inspired me. The, it, it's the ultimate rags to riches story, right? We realize where we are spiritually, and we humble out, and we say, okay, the only thing that's going to make me pure is God's word. That's it. Don't, don't complicate this. You don't need a, a go uh, self-help book on the, on the bestseller list. You don't need a, a top preacher who's a theologian to tell you that. You don't need a, 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 a better diet and a better you know, time management class to figure out that it is God's word that's powerful and effective, and it's actually going to give you life. You know, I, I, uh, I had to laugh because I remember the, uh, the Cinderella story. You know, if you guys know the Cinderella story, it's the, uh, you know, this, this girl who is basically a slave to her family, and she's going to go to the ball, and, and she's making a dress to go to the ball, and she's going to be beautiful, but she's so busy with the demands of her family that she'll never finish the dress. And all her friends, all her little, you know, all the little creatures, you know, the little mice and the birds, they're all super sad because they're like, wow, Cinderella deserves it, and she'll never get to finish it. And you might be wondering, well, how does this relate to my life? Well, do you feel like that? Do you feel like you're so busy all the time that you never really get to focus on what you really want? See, I had to look up the, the song. It's really funny. You can laugh with me. It's okay. I'm going to make myself look silly. But they start singing, right? The song, Cinderella, Cinderella, night and day, it's Cinderella. Make the fire, fix the breakfast, wash the dishes, do the mopping. And the sweeping and the dusting, they always keep her hopping. She goes around in circles till she's very, very dizzy. Still, they holler Cinderella. See, there's always something, always someone, always something keeping you in circles. See, I've heard a quote that uh, if Satan can't kill you, he'll just make you busy. Isn't that convicting? And so his, Cinderella's friends, they come together, they say, wow, she's never going to get to finish her dress because her family is so demanding. You see that? The world is demanding. The Bible says that we're slaves to sin. We're always running back and forth, always chasing a dream, always chasing something, always trying to attain. And so her friends bring together and they say, let's finish the dress for her. And, uh, you know, they go on singing. They say, we can do it. We can do it. We can help our Cinderella. We can make her dress so pretty. There's really nothing to it. We'll tie a sash around it and put a ribbon through it. When dancing at the ball, she'll be more beautiful than them all. See, and that's the beauty of the kingdom. And, and for all of you that helped with the engagement for me, uh, for Gina and myself, thank you so much. 
it's very similar to this story. There's all these little mice, you know, really helping, putting it together. And I'm just so encouraged. You guys really made it special. If you haven't seen the video, go watch it. It really is a testimony to the glory of God's kingdom. It really is. I'm telling you, God is special. Christ is special. His word is unique. His people are amazing. And as a team, we overcome this stuff together. But it has to start with you realizing what you need. We all need Christ. Finally, in closing, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, just one chapter back, in verse 17. It says, I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They have lost all sensitivity. They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Can you relate to that? I sure can. You've lost all sensitivity. You're just going after it and after it and after it, just trying to feel. God's Word says it's, it's the way you're thinking. We, we have to have our thinking changed. And who better than Christ to do it? He says, come and buy pure gold from me. It's been refined in the fire. I'm going to cover you with pure clothes. In verse 20, he says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which means being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. It's amazing. Who are you married to? Are you married to the world? Or are you married to Christ? It's easy to see a homeless man is married to the world. It's also easy for you to lie to me and tell me that you're doing okay. But stop lying to yourself. You know where you're at. The Bible actually says that you think you're doing okay. And I just want to inspire you, please. Read the Bible. You might realize, wow, I, I, I need help. And so I just want to encourage you, I want to inspire you that, that Christ is the best husband you can have. His word is the best thing you can read. And there really, there's joy on the other side. There really is an amazing journey on the other side if you just be willing to let go of those things you're clinging to. Whatever drugs that is, whatever dreams that is, whatever, whatever it is that you're holding on to, whatever video games, whatever idols, just, just let it go. Trust that God's got your back, and then he's going to make you into a new creation, and then he's going to present you to himself as, as just holy and pure and without blemish, and you're going to be a lot like my fiance, Gina, who's fired up out of her mind, realizing, wow, what's the future going to look like? Call her. She'll tell you. It's amazing to dream and to think, what is it going to be like with God? Walking with him. So I'm spiritually not homeless in rags, but I'm spiritually rich. Clothed with pure white clothes. And so where does it start? It starts with humility. But then it starts with asking for help. So reach out to somebody. Ask him to help you study the Bible and just be humble. Amen. Let's be humble. Let's everybody realize we need help and that God's right there to help us. So I love you guys. I hope you, I pray that you have an awesome Sunday and that this is really 
really just the, the word you needed to hear. Thank you, everybody who has put this together. To God be all the glory.